I hope you're doing great today. In today's video, I'm going to be talking about part three of the periodic table. As with every video that has come before, I'm going to be st I'm going to start by describing a short summary of the actual periodic table. So you can see in this picture, this is the periodic table. Um, it's basically a summary of all the elements we have to this day. The periodic table was first created in 1869 by a Russian chemist named Gregor Mendeleev. He made the periodic table to keep track of what elements had been discovered and also to use it to prove or disprove the existence of new elements. The periodic table has 18 groups of elements. These include the alkali metals, the alkaline earth metals, the transition metals, the metalloids, the other metals, that's actually their name, the non-metals, the halogens, the noble gases, and the rare earth element. There are a lot of fun facts about the periodic table, but for now, I'll just share two of them. One of them is that the halogen group, it will react with just about anything on the periodic table, while the noble gas is basically their polar opposite. It will react with almost nothing on the periodic table. The way to determine whether or not, or with how much intensity something will react with something else, can be determined by seeing how many electrons are in the outer shell of the molecule. Now, to start off, what are the transition elements? So you can see in this picture, the transition elements is a very, very large group of the periodic table. In today's video, I'm going to be discussing these two rows. Um, because the periodic table transition element group is so big, you can't describe it all in one video. Um, you can compare it with the other things on this picture, and you'll see that the transition elements group is very, very big. Now, the transition elements are mostly just made of metals, and these metals include gold, silver, platinum, um, titanium, and also the element of um, iron. Now, these elements are basically the elements that are really important in everyone's day-to-day -day life, but even though like you might not realize it, they don't make up the entire periodic table. There are also other elements that are less known, but they are big movers and shakers of the chemical industry and construction. Some of these elements, most of these elements are in the lower rows, and that's why most people don't know about them. Now, these elements include elements such as technetium, molybdenum, and other ones. Now, you can also look at the element vanadium. Most of you have probably never heard of this, but did you know that without vanadium, there might never have been a car industry? Because vanadium was used to make a crucial alloy for Henry, T Henry Ford's Model T car, and that was the car that basically paved the way for all the other cars that came after it. So without vanadium, there might never have been a car industry. These elements are usually found all over, all over the earth, but especially in the, in the crust. An example of this is the element silicon, which is one of the most abundant elements in the earth's crust. They have ranges, they have uses in the ranges of making alloys that are super strong to be used in fighter planes zooming through the sky. They can be used in things such as artificial hips for elderly people who can't make use of their own. Catalysts, which are basically something that starts off a chain reaction in the chemical industry, and especially electrical conductors. Now this one makes sense, because since they're metals, you would expect most of them to be very powerful electrical conductors. Now, here's where things get interesting. I'm going to start talking about what are the uses of these transition elements. Now, you can look at this picture. This is all the transition elements we have today. Now, it might be a little hard for you to read some of these, but you can see in one of this is iron, and there are also other ones that are very important. I have just actually discussed iron and um, other elements like that in previous videos, so make sure to go check that out. Now, number one, rut rutenium. Some of these elements I might not be able to pronounce correctly, so yeah. Um, rutenium is an element that's used in solar cells because its molecules have the ability, the ability to convert solar energy into electricity. Rhodium is the next one. Rhodium is used as an alloying agent for hardening and improving the corrosion resistance of metals such as platinum. Now, platinum is a jewelry element, but it also has uses in the construction in the construction industry and in, in, in and electronics. Now, electricity can actually corrode a metal down, 
and make it really useless to say. Now, if you were to add some rhodium to a platinum alloy, well, that would make it so the electricity would have a much harder time like making the platinum unfit for use. Palladium. Palladium is an element that doesn't have many uses, but the uses it does have is as a catalyst. When you have chemical reactions to make to combine two elements into a strong alloy, you can use palladium because its elements will react with both of the other ones and start off the, ch the chain reaction that will make the new alloy. Silver. Now everyone's heard of silver. Silver is a very famous metal because of its use in jewelry. But did you know that silver also has very good uses as an electrical conductor? But here's a fact that will blow your mind. Did you know that silver actually has the ability to kill off bacteria like an antibiotic? Because silver's molecules have certain innate properties that basically make bacteria want to get away as far as possible. Now, cadmium. Cadmium is an important part of the process to make an element known as nickel cadmium, which is an alloy between the elements nickel and cadmium. Now, it's the main component in nickel cadmium is the main component in rechargeable batteries, and that's why it's so useful. Hafnium. Hafnium is very useful in absorbing neutrons into itself without, you know, blowing up. This is why it's very useful in nuclear and nuclear plant control rods because if something goes wrong, you just activate those and it'll absorb all the neutrons, neutrons into itself and prevent the whole thing from blowing up. Tantalum. Tantalum is used is another element that's famous in the electronics industry because it's used in very high power resistors, which are resistors that deal with very, very strong currents, very, like a lot. It's also used in dental and dental and surgical instruments because it doesn't cause an immune response. It's one of those elements that the body won't exactly recognize as an intruder and want to destroy it. Now, for the next part, I'm going to be talking about all the all the elements that have been left and their uses. Now, the transition elements part 4. So, this picture basically shows what are the main properties of transition elements. You can see the physical properties, they're shiny because they're metals. They're, con they're good conductors because they're metals. They have high melting points because they're metals. They have high densities because they're metals. Some of them are malleable and ductile, such as gold, which means they're easily pressed into new shapes. But because they're all metals, most of them, they are very hard, strong, and tough when alloyed with the right element. They're used for coins, electric and heat applications, because they're very good conductors, structural materials because they're strong, and they're just overall good for building and making things. Now, you'll see, some of these elements you've probably heard of, and others you probably don't know what they are. Now, tungsten. This is an element that's like a big powerful element because it has the hardest, it has the highest melting point of all metals. And it's very powerful, and that's why it can be used in things such as electrodes and heating elements, because it's able to withstand so much heat. Rhenium. This is an element you've probably never heard of, but when put in an alloy with tungsten, it gives tungsten its pizzazz, because it makes them very strong, and it gives it useful properties, such as resistance to arc corrosion. Osmium. Osmium is kind of like a new element that we don't know much about, so it has a few, very few uses. It's used mostly to make hard alloys that are used in needles, and it's also used as a catalyst to speed up the chemical reaction process in the chemical industry. Iridium. Iridium is an element that's paired with osmium to make hard alloys, and it's also a hardening agent for platinum alloys. What that means is you put the two together and you get something harder than platinum with the properties of platinum. You can see there's a pattern right now you have tungsten and rhenium, both one after the other in the periodic table, and they both melt together. You have osmium and, and iridium, which are both one after the other in the periodic table, and they both melt together. Next, you'll have iridium and platinum that are both after each other in the periodic table, and they melt with each other. Speaking of that, let's get to platinum. Platinum is an element that's very similar to gold, while at the same time being very different. Has very, it, its uses are similar to gold with the looks being different. 
This is because platinum is used in jewelry, electronics, and it's a very good electrical conductor. Now, if you look at gold, it has most of the same properties. Gold is just a little bit more famous because it's very, it's very common in comparison to platinum, or rather not common, it's easier to find. Now, it also is very useful for dentists because it's a very easy malleable element that you can add if you heat it high enough, you can just move it and squish it around with your hands into whatever shape you want, just like a very, very expensive version of Play-Doh. And this is what makes, this is what gives gold an edge over the competitor platinum. Now, the last element in the entire transition element group, mercury. Mercury is an extremely deadly element. It, ha it is the, one of the only two elements, metals to be exact, that is a liquid at room temperature. It also has the ability to phase form into a gas at room temperature, and this is what makes it so deadly. Mercury has certain toxics inside of it that target the brain. And if you inhale mercury, it'll mess with your brain and give you all kinds of weird habits and stuff. Now, if, if you touch mercury on your skin, well, it's not the healthiest thing in the world, but it won't kill you. If you ingest mercury, as long as you go to a proper poison control center, you'll be fine. But if you breathe mercury, there's little you can do to prevent it from messing with your mind. That's why people that work with mercury sometimes get an illness that's known as mercury madness. This is when the mercury messes with their mind so much that it just gives them these weird tendencies. Uh, some of them include having hallucinations, having suicidal thoughts, and other things. But mercury is not without its own uses. Mercury is very useful because, it, because of its own ability to be liquid at room temperature. This means that it can be put into things such as thermometers, thermometers, and um, still be able to be liquid and not just be the solid metal inside of it. This is why it becomes useful for measuring temperature and things like that. So yeah, I hope you enjoyed my presentation. If you did, remember to like, subscribe, and share to my channel. Share my channel, and I'll see you next time. Bye!